is to watch in the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. It's now time to look more closely at the issue of ease of doing business, an index which places Nigeria at 146 out of 190 countries ranked under that uh, category. And for a more informed insight on that, we're now being joined here by Jumoke Uduwale, the senior special advisor to the president on the ease of doing business and, of course, trade and investment. Uh, she will be discussing this topic and she will be joined later by Babatunde Ruashe, president of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Dr. Jumoke Uduwale, welcome to uh, the Thank morning you. show. Thank, Thank you. you. This is about the first time yeah. we're having you on the yes, show? Yes, yes. Well, great. Very first time, Thank you yeah. for agreeing mm -hmm. to come. Now, uh, earlier this year, I think, the uh, World Bank, in its latest ranking, indicated that Nigeria had made uh, some progress. Uh, but that study um, is based mainly on, I think, Kano and Lagos, right? Um, do we have subnational studies? Do we have a sense of what happens in other parts of Nigeria? And if so, uh, what are the challenges? What are the uh, specific... Uh, you know, details across Thank the country? You. Yeah, that's a very good question. So Nigeria is one of very few countries, about 11 countries that are ranked by two cities. Most countries in the world, out of 190, based on the commercial capital. That's for the World Bank, ease of doing business. And the reason why we're ranked with Lagos and Kano is because we were over 100 million population as of 2013. But we're also one of 18 countries that are privileged to have subnational ease of doing business rankings. So since 2008, the World Bank has come to rank Nigeria, um, all our states, and there was the latest one done last year in 2018. And for the first time, every single state participated, and we could see the nuances at a subnational level. Now, what this does it is, is it helps states to benchmark with each other and with other cities across the world, other commercial centers. We're looking at things like regulations. We're looking at um, enforcement of contracts. We're looking at how easy it is to start a business. So you have the subnational ease of doing business report that was released in 2018. And I'm, I'm proud to say that every state participated. And we had 32 states moving in the right direction. We had over 40 reforms recognized by the, the World Bank for state interventions. And this validation is done by the private sector. So you literally saw private sector and states responding to the detail and the amount of attention being given by state governments. We had uh, our top five most improved states, starting with Kaduna. We had Enugu, Anambra, Lagos. So states have taken it very seriously. The National Economic Council uh, collectively decided to work on ease of doing business as an issue. So the PEBEC has been working with the NEC since 2017 to replicate a system because at the end of the day, it's one economy. Most businesses don't look at, oh, I, I just uh, have my business in Lagos. They might get things from Ogun, they might get things from Kwara, they might get things from uh, Adamawa. So it's important that one economy, every stakeholder works together. So congratulations on the fact that Nigeria was one of the top 20 most improved countries. <laughs> Let me offer you that. That's really <laughs> great. But you've mentioned a few of the topics that I looked at. So there are 10 topics with several indicators under each topic. Where have we progressed the most? What really boosted us? And where are we still having challenges? OK, this is a very good question again. And thank you for that. Now, traditionally, the most active reform is starting a business. And this is globally. And the reason is that uh, countries realize that, we, especially a country like ours with teeming youth population and not enough jobs and entrepreneurial spirit, we knew it was important to focus on that entry into the business climate. Um, if, uh, if someone can have an idea and turn it into a business and scale it up, every single business was once an idea. Um, so we've worked a lot on starting a business. When we started this three years ago, there were about six manual forms, and the process took several weeks, uh, even up to months sometimes. Now it's an electronic process online. You can reserve a business name in two hours, and you can register a business in, in 24 hours. So that has really significantly boosted us. But then the competition there is fierce, so you don't always see it in the rankings, because everybody is also working on that. We've had some particularly thorny issues that we had to give specific attention. And even though the, the public may still have the lag and not feel it yet, private sector had to recognize, and I'm talking about trading across border, like our ports now. Believe it or not, we've made significant progress there this year. 
because we've been working in depth, well, I say behind the scenes, but private sector was able to validate certain changes, and that reflected for us because we were extremely doing extremely poorly. And we still have a lot of work to do. But the fact is that because of where we're coming from, everything we've done was able to reflect. We also have areas like enforcement of contracts. Um, our states, have, um, courts, uh, particularly Lagos, has been overburdened. Uh, it's a commercial nerve center, after all. So we were able to partner with Lagos State Judiciary to establish a small claims court in 2018, April of 2018. And that has significantly begun to decongest, there are 15 of them across the state, begun to decongest or, well, what it is is that it's a 60-day intervention, self-representation, simple rules, so you can self-represent up to 10 million naira liquidated damages, and it can be enforced within 30 days. So end-to-end -end 90 days, and private sector have begun to use that. So that also counted for us because they told the World Bank that that has been good for them. Kano has also established. But I should make the point that other states are not being left behind. Edo is about to implement their own small claims court. Ogun State, too, is very interested in that. In fact, today, we start our subnational ease of doing business tour with a kickoff event right here in Lagos. So you're invited. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And a major threat to the ease of doing business, of course, is the insecurity of human capital. Mm -hmm. And we're stuck in a situation where now some people believe that kidnapping has actually never been as prevalent as it is in Nigeria today as it has ever been before. And we have several insecurity threats hitting us, which is making it really hard for investors, uh, sorry, for investors to test the climate of Nigeria. And that is affecting us in a serious, serious way. How are we trying to overcome this problem and work alongside the right departments and agencies to tackle and curb insecurity, which is really just putting a halt to the ease of doing business for us? Mm. I really appreciate that opportunity, this question, to speak to. When I presented to the governors uh, on the subnational ease of doing intervention, last year we came up with the idea of doing a subnational survey, and the governors themselves insisted that Rather than just looking at regulatory issues, there are other issues that are really topical. And the first thing they asked to be added to that survey was security and infrastructure. So security and infrastructure, those are some of the things that it will help states even know where they stand and how other states are tackling some of these issues, how they're perceived by private sector. And most importantly, perceptions are not always reality. So giving um, states the opportunity to showcase um, how business can still be done. If people have the idea that, oh, you can't even move near a certain part of the country, but it's not so. There are actually businesses functioning and some even thriving. Um, we have war-torn countries that are still doing business, and we're not even close to that. So the point is that knowledge is everything. When investors, particularly domestic investors, are informed, then they can spread around the country. So we're looking at workforce readiness, because we need to know where the labor is. We're looking at information and access to information, transparency. Of course, the regulatory environment, what kind of levies, charges, uh, how are the courts in the states. Um, and we're also looking at um, just all the things that would help businesses take a decision. The idea is to decongest our commercial capitals, like Lagos, uh, Port Harcourt, maybe Abuja, Kano and let the development spread across the country. We should have people in Gombe, we should have people everywhere where we should have business or capital going to every nook and cranny of the country. Um, when Nigerian investors move, then foreign investors have the confidence. You know, people may hear about things like Boko Haram or kidnapping, and they may assume that we're not going about doing our normal business. We live in Nigeria. We travel the length and breadth of Nigeria. It's not to say that there are not challenges. And the security agencies, because you did talk about that, are trying hard. And you've heard Mr. President speak about this on a number of occasions. But the fact is that we still have to continue, because it is only prosperity, as you rightly pointed out, that will help reduce these um, human intervention issues that we face. It's a global challenge, but I think we just have to take it one step at well, a time. Yeah. I like the fact that you've talked about some of the states yeah. where there is a lot of improvement. Mm. Kaduna, Enugu, Lagos, Ogun, and all of these other mm. states. But still, one gets the impression that this ease of, you know, uh, business environment agenda is mainly a federal government agenda. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you've talked about some of the states that have shown interest, and if you look at those states, it's understandable. 
that you know they think this is an important thing. Where are those states? Which states are the ones lagging behind? And what kind of uh, steps, you know, um, is your council taking to get those states, you know, uh, to, to move and okay. to achieve the objective of ensuring that this is nationwide and not just concentrated in some okay. places? Okay, I, I like this, this uh, team, and I'm not going to get into trouble here with my government. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, though, that I'm very proud of the National Economic Council because it's also chaired by the vice president, but we made a presentation to them that, you know, PEBEC has been working since 2016. So in 2017, the minister then and I made a presentation to them and said, this system is working at a federal level. But Nigerian economy, the businesses are in the states. The land is in the states. They're physically in the states. Let's replicate this system. And they unanimously agreed. So I would say that every single state is on board. That's why they all attended uh, the right of reply. That's like engaging with the World Bank. They all met with their stakeholders. They've all started taking steps. We've been going around the country for over 18 months now. We've been going by, by region. Usually one governor hosts the region. So we've gone to so many places. And one, go one state would host. But the public servants from the region and the private sector from the region will come together. And we, we talk about the issues. When the private sector say what the challenges are, in some states, let's say border states, they may be talking about smuggling. In some states uh, that are by the ocean line, they may be talking about their ports. In some states that are sort of landlocked, they may be talking about the roads and infrastructure. So we, we, we uh, play to exactly the regions and the, how they can work together collaboratively. The states have been committed. I told you earlier that, and I, and I will share that subnational report with you from 2018, because when it comes from outside, it helps to validate what we're saying, that the system okay. Maybe is working. Maybe let's take a short commercial okay. break. <laughs> when we return, then you yeah. can share that subnational report okay. with us. Okay. Because I mean, yeah. I, I guess we'll be interested. Yeah. We'll Absolutely. take a short commercial break yeah. now. We'll return shortly. Stay tuned. Yeah. You're still watching The Morning Show here on the Arise News Channel. And we still have with us in the uh, studio Dr. Jumoke Udwole, uh, the Executive Secretary of the Presidential uh, Environment, Ease of Doing Business Environment uh, Council. And joining us uh, and joining her also is Mr. Babatunde Ruwashe, the President of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mr. Ruwashe, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll bring you uh, into the conversation shortly. Okay. Before you came, uh, Dr. Udwole was talking about the subnational report yeah. on the Ease of Doing Business uh, Environment in Nigeria. And she was going to take us through some of the findings of the latest report. Yes, Dr. Duale, you may continue. Okay, thank you very much. So I was just saying that some of the reasons why uh, some states really made progress was actually because of what their private sector were able to validate. Kaduna State, which tops the rankings right now, did a lot of um, work. They passed legislation on tax consolidation. Their investment promotion agency has been extremely active with uh, attracting investors, hand-holding them, end-to-end -end and phenomenal investor aftercare. This is what private sector says, not what uh, Kaduna State government is, is tooting their own horn. So it's a validation that when states do pay attention, uh, the state that is second, um, Jigawa State, the governor is really very active. So I will share the full rankings, and it's really on the World Bank website. But the point is that when governments pay attention and listen to stakeholders, and make even the easiest or tweakest changes. The uh, private sector does appreciate. Um, the idea is to make things quicker, the ease of doing business, well, pardon the pun, the speed, reducing the cost, and then transparency. Businesses want to know with certainty, how long will it take me to get this? So we have the executive order at the federal level. We have the executive order one the first of this administration. And what that does is mandate MDAs to have specific service level agreements with the public and with each other. And we have the report.gov.ng tracking that feedback from the private sector. So a lot of governors have been um, prioritizing the business climate because they do need internally generated revenue. And it's a no brainer that really a lot of our, our problems across the country stem from the need for uh, more revenue and more prosperity for everybody to thrive for jobs. That speaks to the security question. So it's work in progress, um, but it's definitely the system is working. And it's a homegrown one that we've actually been asked to come speak on internationally. 
It's a homegrown um, sort of structure working to best fit in Nigeria. Um, it's a lot of work left to do, not to paint the impression that we're there yet, far from it, but just to note that we're in the right direction. I'd like to say, just before Dr. Abati brings in Mr. Rowash into the conversation, that there's actually hope. You know, you were asking about some of the states who were lagging behind. It's important to note that my state, Ogun State, was last in the subnational report in, in 2014, 2014, and now yes. we're one of the most improved. So <laughs> hope springs eternal. Yeah, <laughs> our state. Oh, okay. It's, uh, it's an Ogun State uh, team here this morning. Well, Mr. Rowash, I mean, we've been talking with uh, Dr. Oduwale. She is the secretary of the Presidential Ease of Business Environment uh, Council. Yes. And uh, she's been taking us through, you know, uh, a picture of what is going on in the country and the, the various states that have improved, the challenges, the areas of uh, reform. But you are the president of the uh, Lagos Chamber of uh, Commerce. And you have the opportunity here to talk to the uh, secretary of this Ease of Doing Business. What are the challenges that you have seen uh, that you think that... Uh, the ease of doing business council, either at the federal level or in the various states, we need to address urgently. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, the ease of doing business with Jumoke, we have always been there together, uh, <laughs> been consulting with them. And uh, I must comment that these states that you have mentioned are actually being led by people from private sector. They, were, they had private sector background before they became they move into governance. Okay, the governors. Yes. So it's not uh, surprising that we are getting that. And what does that tell us? It means that the private sector actually should be the player, the big player in the scheme of things in Nigeria. Government should actually provide enabling environment. And the laws are very clear. The, the uh, compliance, we are ready to comply. The, for the private sector, the bottom line is profit. If you spend money, you must make more money for you to continue. It's not the same as when it, in political sphere we are told that what is wisdom in boardroom may not necessarily be wisdom when it comes to politics. So the more the government gives the private sector a very clear, the rules are clear, the level playing ground, everybody knows what is clear, what we are to do, and there is clarity. This, uh, this policy somersault at times also is an hindrance to the private sector. So if we could have all these things in place, I'm sure we would grow. And of course, the truth is that more of this nation's wealth, by default or otherwise, is with the private sector. Absolutely. Yeah. Following on from that, just, I want you to comment on that, I Jumake. Really and also, um, the CBN's monthly publication, Business Expectation Survey, last month, September's report, said exactly what you just said, sir, that the problems that firms are identifying, apart from power supply, is a lack of clarity with, with economic laws, their financial problems that they have, high interest rates, mm -hmm. unfavorable political climate, are all unfavorable yeah. for businesses. What, okay. are, what are your comments really, on that? Really, that's spot on. Um, what the private sector has always told us, in fact, we have always said to the private sector, is that government spend is less than 10% of GDP. So we've always worked very closely with organized private sector, and we have regular uh, stakeholder uh, engagements. We need private sector. It's existential. It's not even optional. It's not a favor. It's not a... We actually need private sector to, to thrive. And private sector has said that some of the policies aren't working for them, some of the lack of clarity. So the PEBEC has a regulatory intervention. Uh, we work closely. We, we piloted it with two regulators, NAFDAQ and NICOM, on the request of private sector. That's this, this came out of engagement, stakeholder engagement with private sector. And that intervention started last um, August, yes, 2018 August. So we've been working with NAFDAQ. There was a lot of, and we were talking offline about a number of the businesses in that space um, needing clearer regulation, less cost, the speed of testing. We have a, a number of, of businesses that are just in the food and, and drug, cosmetics, shea butter, zobo, all sorts of very creative Nigerian businesses. So we've been working with NAFDAQ to simplify their processes and reduce the cost. Um, larger private sector in particular has talked about the cost of capital. In fact, everybody talks about the cost of capital. That really I would leave with, with CBN. Although government does uh, borrow from the market, 
and there, there are a number of reasons why, which I wouldn't go into um, for, for the way the economy is currently structured, but trying to make sure there's an opportunity for smaller businesses to use movable assets as collateral. So the CBN has a movable assets national collateral registry. Uh, we have uh, credit bureaus. We worked with the National Assembly to pass two legislations in 2017. Some of the enabling environment, as Mr. Ruashi said, the, 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 the job of government is to really put... In fact, Nigeria went up to number six in the world for our enabling environment in access to credit, but then you still have private sector needing credit. That's because uh, access to credit does have to do with banks, microfinance, lending, the reg their regulators, CBN. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a nuanced conversation, but we are putting in place that enabling legislative and regulatory um, environment for such businesses to thrive. It continues to be ongoing. We have to listen closely, and we have to basically make... Um, in now, for CBN to be saying that, that's really good, because one of the biggest criticisms that this administration has had is fiscal and monetary policy not quite aligning as they should, but that is being like worked on and we hope to see really better days ahead. Absolutely. And we just got the budget alloc um, allocation coming in as well. And Dr. Oduwale, one thing that you mentioned was infrastructure and how that's a huge part of the ease of doing business. Now we're seeing 262 billion naira being budgeted for infrastructure. And people are hoping that we're not just going to throw this money towards new projects, but also put it towards the maintenance of existing projects. How much of this budget allocation should we be seeing going towards the maintenance of existing projects to ensure that we're actually doing something about that problem before bringing new problems in? Yeah, That's well, a question both ways. Where? Well, that is definitely for the ministers to answer. That's their policy um, um, call. But as an administration, this administration has been very diligent since 2015 in finishing existing projects, like the Kaduna Abuja Rail, uh, the Lagos Ibadan Road, so many existing projects, uh, because we exactly have that view. Before you start another, like, huge project, there are so many across. So I do know just from being uh, in the presidency that the Minister of uh, Works and Housing has prioritized completion of existing road projects mm. and has made sure that currently, as we speak, there's at least one federal road being worked on across well, the Dr. country. Dr. Duale, we'll need to take another commercial <laughs> break, and then when we return, uh, the conversation will continue. <laughs> Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching The Morning Show here on the Arise News channel. And still with us in the studio is Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, the special advisor to the president on ease of doing business, and also Mr. Babatunde Ruwashe, the president of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you for staying with us. Now, before we went on a break, I posed a question with regards to the budget allocation to infrastructure and what we should, what we should be seeing, rather, coming out of that. Mr. Ruwashe, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, on infrastructure. The government, the truth is that the government will never have enough money to deal with infrastructural requirement in Nigeria, looking at our space. But what one will expect is a situation where we reduce the cost of governance so that you can have more money that will be thrown into the basket of infrastructural development. But ultimately, we need to have a PPP arrangement yeah. where we can tap from this enormous resource that is lined with the private sector. But private sector will only come in if they are sure of the rules, if they are, have confidence that when we start it, whatever government says it will do is what will happen, not somebody changing the rules, uh, the rule of the game halfway. Mm -hmm. Like when you talk of roads, government will never have enough money to do roads. And that's the truth. So you need to bring in private sector investment into roads. But then people will have to pay for using the road. That's why we are talking of the towing, towing of the thing that uh, we have what those got gotten back to. We have to, you can concession those roads, they will be maintained, and users will pay users' fee by way of towing. But then what we have done in the past, when we did, did the dismantling of the toll gates, was not just dismantling, like people have said. There was this five naira tax, fuel tax that was actually imposed on petroleum uh, products. Don't know your yes. your that was what he did. The 55 Naira, we don't know where the money is. That money should have been available to do maintenance of the road. But because we are doing this subsidy of a thing, which we also believe should have gone several years back, 
the five naira was was not known that it was lying there in lieu of what we would have paid as to to do the maintenance of the road. So we have to go back to Israel where the roads, this infrastructure are actually uh, brought into PPP arrangement and people have to pay to, then you can now insist on maintenance. If I pay to, if I go through a tow plaza, I won't expect to go in, into a, a bad road. Then I can ask question. But if we are saying that the federal government will be able to do roads, we won't have enough money to do it and it's very clear that most of the wealth of this nation lies with the private sector. So we must work out something that will and can, and, uh, make the private sector to have confidence in the government uh, that if I go into this with government, there won't be a policy shift along the way. So that's what we need well, to do. Mr. Let's talk about trade facilitation and trade negotiations. What's your assessment of the environment in terms of the quality of support that the uh, pri uh, private sector gets from the Nigerian government? And then for you, uh, uh, Dr. Duole, um, the Office of Trade Negotiations was uh, something that government took uh, very seriously. But what is happening there? How soon are we going to have uh, a replacement for Ambassador Chedu Osakwe, who was actually the person driving uh, that office? Do you have any information in terms of how the place is structured? And Because sometimes when the man who has the vision and is driving it, when he dies or he leaves, you know, we just drop the ball. We tend to do that all the time. But let me start with you, uh, Ambassador, uh, Mr. Rawashi. Yeah, trade facilitator, uh, facilitation and support that uh, the private sector gets, we are not there yet. Because uh, take, for instance, the sort of experiences one gets with the customs, which is actually the front uh, uh, officers when you come to trade facilitation. Today, the budget that we have, we, is, we use the figure 305 as a conversion rate. But in calculating the duty, is a 326. So that also we've been saying, I mean, let's have one rate that is market driven. Forex window. Forex window. The government is the same 305, but when I import today, the duty is calculated based on 326. That is not good for business. Uh, you also have a situation where you clear your goods and you are leaving the port and you have FOU down the road, stopping the container, and says that you have not paid adequate uh, duty that should be paid. Uh, of course, the, the consignment could be taken in, and then there is a lot of, they give you a debit note, you have underpaid. But the truth ab about it is that this consignment must have been cleared and signed up by an officer. So usually we should go back to that officer and say, why did you allow this to go when he had underpaid? It shouldn't be when the consignment is actually on the road and you have been cleared and, and I thought I've done everything that had to do with customs, that somebody should be there. So that has to do with the clarity and actually government knowing what we are supposed to do as business people. Now, going to the closure of the borders, I still don't believe that that is the best way to do that thing. If we have problem with importation, we should be able to deal with it in a different manner that will not disrupt the business of those who are doing legitimate business. We, it's not, it can be true that everybody that goes across the border is a smuggler, both ways, either in or out of the place. But what we have had now is a situation where the border has been short, or is partially short. There is a lot of terminology that is being used. But the truth is, because people still go across the border, but those who are doing legitimate businesses may not be able to access and go across the border. And those who want to smuggle in will still smuggle in. It's just that the stake will be higher. What you pay now will be higher than what you will pay ordinarily. So if we are talking of a big volume of rice being smuggled into this country, it's not by the Keke, Mara, or Kada that we see that will be bringing in such a big volume of smuggled rice into the country. It must have been something that is organized. It's a very big business. It's trailers that brings it into this country. And they are being kept in a particular warehouse. So the government should have devised modern way of and intelligence of getting at who are the people behind this. But the truth is that if there is demand, people will always find their way. The rice that we produce presently in Nigeria is not enough to cover the demand of the market. So instead of saying that no rice can come into Nigeria, you can bring in rice through our borders. Government can put very heavy tariff on it. Whatever money that we make will be used to actually enable 
the local production of rice until such a time when we get to the level that Nigerians don't want to buy uh, imported rice, or it's, it doesn't make sense wasting your money to buy imported rice. And, uh, it will disappear over time without anybody actually having to close the border. Uh, the government should also should patronize the local rice. I'm sure if all the governments and the schools and all this are patronizing local grown rice, imported rice would disappear over time. Of course, we are talking of whatever we have benefited by not taking uh, uh, petroleum products across the border. The way out of that is to remove the subsidy. If we remove subsidy, there will, be, there will be no incentive for anyone to want to take anything across the border. And indeed, we could even have created an economy of supplying those our neighboring countries of, of products that ordinarily they would have been smuggled to them. So I think closing the border is actually a disincentive to business. And a lot of legitimate uh, business persons are suffering and they are making losses by the day. This is actually at the heart of it, and it shows how government, at times, government uh, agencies look at ways of doing their businesses that is uh, cutting your nose to spite your face. So that's Dr. Adore, what are your comments on that, especially in mm. view of the fact that the government has boasted of the economic benefits that the closure has secured, mm -hmm. and also customs revenue has skyrocketed, so, uh, such that the Senate has increased the customs target by like 400 billion naira. So what are your thoughts on the border closure? Given that in the ease of doing business reports, one of the indices that we're ranked on is trading across borders. Mm -hmm. Come October 24th, when the 2020 ranking is released, will this affect our standing? Um, the, the short question, the short answer to that is no, because the cutoff date um, passed a few months ago. I would say that a lot of Mr. Ruesh's comments are fair comments, and I'm not one to hold a very defensive position. I believe in a lot of engagement and feedback. And uh, we have heard this from different uh, quarters in um, the private sector. What we're doing is trying to find a balance. We have a serious economic problem. I've also heard from businesses that are very happy that at last they're getting some respite and protection and relief just from the smuggling, the counterfeiting of their products. Even just a, a couple of days ago, I was, I was listening to, to a company, and they were actually very, very happy. Me being a trade lawyer, um, personally, I would say that it's not a long-term resolution. And what we have also been recommending and advocating is that we find best fit ways to address the problems. Now, the problems are nuanced. We have neighbors um, that need to do better. We have neighboring countries. We also have our part as Nigerians to curb the smuggling challenge. We also have to make sure that companies based in Nigeria or companies based in ECOWAS supplying into Nigeria have free flow in our seaports, in our, in our, across our land borders. These are things that have to be in place Companies have to have certainty to plan and where they position their plants. We don't want that to backfire on us also. So there's a number of issues that I'm, I'm trying to touch on, and there's a balance to be had. But definitely, I do not believe, I cannot say, but I do not believe it's, a, it's, going to, it's, it's never a permanent solution to the problem. And the problems don't go away. You might get some respite for a while, but you still have to meet uh, them further down the road and work on them. Uh, we are working on leveraging technology, single window, at our seaport, starting with Lagos. The Honorable Minister of Finance and Transport have been on that for a while. Uh, deploying scanners, also he mentioned customs, deploying scanners to remove that human contact and rent-seeking opportunity, very important one. So automation. Yeah. Yes, automation, it's really important. Removing the human contact and the rent-seeking opportunities, really important. The private sector having the certainty. I hope there will be enough electricity to, to, <laughs> <There will. laughs> to effectuate there that. There will. You know, you know that there's so many IPPs, you'll be surprised. When, when thing, there's so many independent power plants, especially in Lagos State. There's so many of them. That, that's why you have the streetlights working. Um, it's one of the best lit cities in the country. Mm. It, there's, there's power in different pockets, in, in hospitals, in schools, in universities. Um, and we have a willing buyer, willing seller. 
speaking of, of electricity and, and access to power. So there are a number of things, never enough time, but there are a number of interventions that are going on. Even some of the things that Mr. Urashi talked about, some things are already being done to address them, like what I just mentioned with the deployment of, of automation. But what I like is when we continue, there's nothing he has said today that he hasn't told me before and that I'm not aware of and that others haven't said sort of a contrary view also. So we're trying to work for the whole economy to work. We're going into Af the African Continental Free Trade Agreement implementation next year, trying to get ready for that. And there's a whole team leading that. Uh, very sadly, we lost uh, my friend and colleague, Ambassador Chiedu Osakwe, uh, just two weeks ago. And he hasn't even been buried yet. But the, the project has been going on uh, for a while. He's actually been, been on, on a leave of absence uh, for about eight months now. Mm. But he still was able to come for the signing. He still was able to work. And his team has been in place. There's also a readiness, uh, implementation readiness committee, a very robust one with uh, hundreds of, of public servants and representation from the private sector that delivered the report that uh, led to the uh, ultimate signing of the agreement by Nigeria. And there's an implementation uh, committee, a national committee that is, is already, uh, Mr. Gobadia is leading the, the technical part of that, already going ahead to get Nigeria ready. Nigeria is already um, quite well placed. When you look at the continent, we are actually one of the strongest. We have only about four or five economies that we'll be looking at maybe South Africa, Morocco, not too many of them at all are actually at the level that we are at in terms of dominating trade across the continent. But we understand uh, what our private sector, I mean, we're for them, we're their champions. We, we, that's my job, actually, <laughs> to make sure that they are, they are comfortable. We'll have yeah. to go at this point. I thank wish the conversation could continue. Yes. So many things to still uh, yes. talk about. So yes. thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.